Well, good evening, all. Hope everyone's doing well on a Saturday, Saturday night, October 3rd. Uh, a uh, new, new environs for me as we are, uh, as I am broadcasting from the Hyatt in Johns Creek, our temporary abode while before we move, uh, we move uh, into our new home. But, uh, yeah, I thought a lot of people were different. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm holed up in two suites with four dogs and a bunny. So um, A bunny, huh? Yeah, yeah, we have a rabbit. So uh, anyway, how are you guys doing? A good week for you all? Busy week. Busy, busy, busy week. Oh, conquering the world? Yes? Well, no, but getting, conquer the world. getting ready for a big thing at, at work. We did a beta test of... Uh, of uh, something last week and now this week was um, doing all the follow on work from that and uh, sort of getting everything squared away. And there was lots of things to, to, to fix and not lock down and stuff like that. So, but. Gotcha. Um, gotcha, gotcha. And, and, uh, and Patrick, uh, we, we see a, a random UFO flying on, around behind you. Oh, oh, the, uh, <laughs> aha. So he, he, yeah. he hasn't learned that the magician should never reveal, reveal it. <laughs> I know. It was a big mystery until he uh, stepped into the camera view. Yes. Whatever, whatever you do, Pat, you should not report that UFO because it will hurt your credibility as a pilot. That's true. That's true. And, uh, uh, yeah, apparently I was – actually, I was listening to a book called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe the other day, and they're like, yeah, people somehow think pilots are a better source or a more credible source of UFO sightings. They're as, they're as wrong as everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, I was going to say about UFOs, some of that stuff is, is, you know, there was that story that came out about five years ago that talked about how uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency had been running this UFO program. Yeah. Um. Some of that was actually, I like, I knew it turns out a bunch of the people that were doing that, that were part of that. Part of that was actually my, the office that I worked in before I got there. The part of it was the office that I worked in. Um, and so it was, it was one of those things that used to come up in meetings. People would, would say, well, you know, it's DIA, you know, they, they did the Stargate and wormholes paper. And I said, it wasn't just any part of DIA. That was my office. Congratulations! Yeah. What was the and what was that exactly? What? So, um, so there was there were two parts of it. One was a part to examine UFO reports, um, and like the the Tic Tac UFO sighting thing. Um, that was one of the videos that had been. Re so it was basically DIA's only own Project Blue Book. Um, this had some um, important. Um, it was an important project of 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 Senator Reed, who was the Senate majority leader at the time. And, you know, it's an executive branch agency. We don't usually, we wouldn't normally do tasking from Congress, but when Congress puts money in and says, you will, here are some money that you will use to do this, you know, okay, it's, it's part of the law. We have to do it. So they created an office to sort of examine, it's sort of a project blue book, but with DIA. And then there was another piece of it to look at various technology stuff. Um, and so there was a bunch of different technology papers. So what did DIA discover? Um, so a lot of that stuff, a lot of it was material science type stuff. There was like 30 different topics. And a lot of it was things like where we think material science is going to go in the next 20 years. Um, and others were other stuff, um, including one on stargates and wormholes. Um, which basically boiled down to they're really hard and we don't see this being an issue anytime soon. And most, most of it was on class, but you know, there are a few things that were at higher classification levels. So it was so interesting. Is, so in, in the government world, what, what is, I mean, where are we with UFOs? What, what is the official position? So, um, this is a good time to remind everybody that I do not speak for any employer, past, present, or future. Um, these are my opinions. Never seen one. Yeah, we, um, we need to have a, we need to have a lower that says just that. 
I don't know that there actually is a government position on UFOs. I know that things like Project Blue Book looked at UFOs and concluded that not a threat. Now, there's, and this is purely my opinion, there's some indication. So first of all, the Project Blue Book people knew what was really going on. So there were times where it's like, oh, yeah, that's an SR-71. We know that it's an SR, it was an SR-71. And so sometimes they could identify what it was, but they didn't for classification reasons. Sometimes they couldn't figure it out, and they said so. Um, but their basic conclusion was, we don't think that there's a, you know, whatever is going on here, it's not a threat. But people don't have a full appreciation of exactly how wonky radar can be and how unreliable even trained observers uh, can be when you're dealing with shifting perspectives and things like that. Like I'm, I haven't gone through that, that the famous Tic Tac video from the F-18 pilots, but I'm told that if you like graph out where they were looking and what their course and heading was, et cetera, it looks like the thing is moving, but actually all the movement was caused by the camera and the aircraft and that the thing they're looking at is essentially stationary. And if you plot it all out on paper, you can you can convince yourself very easily. It's like, yeah, this thing isn't moving, so it was probably just a weather balloon. There's a image that I saw recently. A bunch of people reported a UFO, and it looked like a saucer with sort of a glowing bit in the middle, et cetera. It was the Goodyear blimp in the distance. Looked at from the side, it looks like a saucer. You can't see the fins from that far away. It's got the big light panel on it. And they were like doing some test patterns on the light panel and it looked like this saucer. And SR-71, if you look at an SR-71 from the front, it kind of looks like a saucer. Um, they, in order to decrease the radar cross section caused by the exhaust, because the, the that ionized exhaust actually reflected radar waves, they tried to make a stealthy airplane and then later discovered that the that the exhaust was making them a really big radar target. So they added stuff to the exhaust to try to cut that down. And the stuff they added made it glow green. And then on top of that, when the SR-71 would break the sound barrier, they usually did this maneuver where they would, they would dip down when they went transonic and then they would come back up. And so if you're looking at it from head on, you've got this thing that looks kind of like a flying saucer surrounded by a green glow that's moving in the vertical. But so. if, if you're getting a head on view of an SR-71, you got to be pretty far up there to begin with. Well, but you're, you're uh -oh. like far on the horizon, right? Okay. So, yeah. So... So I'm not talking about airborne guys. I'm talking about people on the ground. And so every time the SR-71 flew, all the UFO reports would come pouring in, and the Air Force's official position was no comment. When in reality, they knew exactly what it was. They just don't talk about that stuff. Right. If you go back to Roswell, I'm I'm actually, you know, they came out with this thing a little while ago, a few years ago, um, where, um, where it looks like the Roswell crash was a balloon that was part of a project to put microphones high up in the atmosphere to listen for Soviet nuclear detonations. And all the weird miracle metal stuff, et cetera, if you go through and you read those descriptions, it sounds exactly like mylar. Right, exactly and a lot of those balloons are made of mylar, right? Well, you know, back in 1947, these days, Balloons are made out of mylar, and everybody knows about mylar. Back in 1947, if you encountered mylar, you'd go, what the hell is that? And so the thing is, is that stuff like that gets, gets uh, you know, becomes, you know, starts off as a government program. Teflon was invented for the Manhattan Project. I did not know that. Um, um, I think it was for the Manhattan Project. It, it was, it was, I want to say that Teflon... They needed something that they could make parts out of so that they could move, but they didn't want, they needed to be slippery because they didn't want to, they couldn't use um, petroleum-based lubricants because they would react with the uranium hexafluoride and that would be bad. And so the solution was they made, they made 
they invented Teflon to to make those stuff those things work. And I, you know, I I heard that from a friend of mine. I I've never independently confirmed that. But his dad was at the MIT radiation lab doing um, radar development stuff during the war, and like he had this piece, this block of Teflon. You know, Teflon really was one of those things that really sort of came out in the late sixties, early seventies. I remember hearing about Teflon, you know, when Teflon coated cookware first started coming out, it was developed way before that. It just took them a while to figure out how to get it to stick to anything. Because if you think about it, the thing about Teflon is you want some stuff to, you want it to stick to some stuff really hard and not stick to other stuff at all. <laughs> kind of hard. You know, <laughs> you know, where I first heard of Teflon was uh, that TV show V when the resistance was finally able to kill the aliens, it turns out they had Teflon coated bullets <laughs> and it cut through the alien armor. <laughs> I didn't even remember that. <laughs> Funny. I was just thinking about that today for some strange reason. Don't know. Can't explain why. I I liked V in it, in its weird sort of way. I didn't really, I only saw one episode of the new V. Um, but the old V had this great line. You may, may remember that there were two, Two bad girls, two two villain uh, female villains in it, um, and I can't Diane. Diane, and I can't remember the other one, the blonde and the brunette. <laughs> uh, and the 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 blonde was later in this is Spinal Tap, and the blonde at one point they're they're squaring off um, through some sort of ritualistic duel, and the blonde says, "I've never lost into the death combat," and the brunette says. Idiot, if you had, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kind of should go without saying. <laughs> and I thought it was just fantastic that somebody finally came back to some some statement like that and, and did that. I thought that was great. So I'm trying to see if there's anything in the comments. Yeah, my brother points out that you we know that UFOs exist because all it stands for is unidentified flying object. Although it's funny, they're not using um, they're not using the term UFO anymore uh, officially. They're using something else. Um, Unid unidentified aerial phenomenon. Yes, um, something like that. So, for anyone who's interested, however. There is a podcast called the Fighter Pilot Podcast. <laughs> um, on episode 35 from January 2nd, 2019, they talk about UFOs and they go into that story with an interview of the uh, of the pilot that's kind of been been okay. on some of those shows. But it's a really good interview. It's at least it's at least an interesting interesting thing. So for anyone who's interested, I like that. Uh that chart that's a good chart and this is this is just hysterical because everything's a weather balloon except for a weather balloon which is swamp gas so i think it's i think i think it's pretty subtle but uh, i well also i don't understand why ufos always have to be flying saucers did is, has anyone ever done a study to tell us why an interstellar craft would be a saucer um if you go and you look at like the Bob Lazar stuff, et cetera. They, there's some double, some techno geek reasons why that supposedly is the case, but you know, it's all, um, it has something to do with there being in a gravitational, there's a ring, an accelerator ring that causes anti-gravity or something like that. Um, when we tried developing saucer shaped aircraft, we discovered that saucers are really, really bad designs for aircraft. They're like, they thought that they would be really aerodynamic, et cetera. And it turns out it's not true at all. So what you're not seeing is that when Buddy jumped up here, he brought a bunch of litter with him. So thank you, Buddy. I appreciate, thank you for the present. Okay, why did everybody go silent? Oh, because I had my mute on. I, oh, okay. I, I am also a huge fan, as everyone knows, a huge fan of the uh, um, uh, German of all the German uh, experimental planes from World War II, um, yeah. especially the GO two twenty nine slash HO nine flying wing. 
Um, and my understanding is that the reason when we developed the XB-35 and then the XB-49 flying wings, when Northrop did those uh, during the, was that the 50s, 40s and 50s, the, the, the challenge was the stability of the flying wing itself, which we didn't yeah. solve until we were able to have fly-by-wire and, and computers became sophisticated enough to, to, to manage the stability of the wing. Yeah, one of those test airplanes. So Edwards Air Force Ga Base is called Edwards Air Force Base because an Air Force test pilot named Edwards was testing one of those airplanes. And when they were combing through the wreckage and they found his kneeboard, um, it, it led them to believe that he was, uh, that the thing that he was just about to do, you know, the last thing that he had written down was that he was going to do a stall test. And the problem is, is that when you stall a flying wing, it has a tendency just to backflip until it hits the ground. Right. It's right. really hard to get out of. Hmm. Probably, and there, better to, probably better to have a little weight up front where your engines are. Or or a, a tail surface. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And a tail surface to yeah. push and your so nose down. It's, it's hard to get out of, you know, Certain airplanes have certain problems. If if you if you look up the F one hundred F one hundred Super Saber, there is a, a particular phenomenon known with it that they called the saber dance. Um, and they would have this problem when they were coming in for landings, uh, low speed coming in for landings, it would start gyrating back and forth. And if uh, if you weren't if you weren't really good, you you could lose the airplane and they lost some huge percentage of those airplanes um, just through crashes. Didn't they also call it the widow maker? Wasn't, was it yeah. that one? I, I know there are a lot of those, those early sixties uh, super fast planes that just killed people at a high rate. Yeah. F one Oh fours killed a lot of people, especially yeah. I think the Germans lost like half of the F one Oh fours that they bought. Really? Yeah. It was some huge number. And I forget why, why it was with them, but, you know, it's, this stuff is hard and they were running through lots of designs and they didn't have computer modeling. They were doing everything in wind tunnels and just sort of, you know, taking measurements, but they didn't have computer modeling for hardly any of it. It's so hard. here it is. It says, uh, despite a variety of fixes, the crashes continued between 15 and 20 German F-104s crashed every year between 1968 and 1972 and continued at a rate of about 10 F-104s per year until it was replaced. Yeah. Uh, the final tally was the loss of 292 of the 916 starfighters and the death of 115 pilots. Yeah, yeah so I was wrong. It was about a third of them. Still, that is insane. That, <laughs> that is insane, yeah. That, that, that is a uh, absolutely shocking, uh, especially when you consider now. Um, you know, we we lose two aircraft and everyone's you know, and everyone's freaking out, right? Yeah, yeah. But we keep aircraft around for a lot longer, and you know, they're talking about the B fifty two being around for a hundred years. Because the first B, the first B fifty twos came out in like 1949, 1950, That time frame is when they first started flying it, uh, test planes. The current B fifty twos, the oldest one was built in like nineteen sixty two, and they're talking about the current plan is to decommission them sometime between twenty fifty and twenty sixty. Wow. And the thing is, they're going to re-engine them. the The plan is to re-engine them. Um, the new engines are so much more efficient that they'll expect to make their money back on the re-engineing in like two years. The airframes were way over-engineered. Um, they, they, they built them like tanks. And, you know, the thing is the B-52 was intended to be an interim bomber. They weren't, they, the plan wasn't to keep it along, around forever. The plan was to replace it with the B-70 and the B-58 and all this other stuff. And it's yet another instance of interim bombers, um, an interim airplane design just being the one that ends up sticking around forever. Just out of yeah. curiosity, with the bombers, because I know there was like the B-47, I think it was the yeah. Hustler. There was a few others. 
was the B-47 in 1940, did it first fly in 47? Because I'm seeing here that the B-52 first flew in 1952, entered service in 55. I was just wondering if they're coming yeah, out. Yeah, it was designed planes. in 49. It was designed in 49. Okay. No, um, no, I don't think that that's the case. I okay. Think that's it, it just occurred to me. I had never yeah. put that together, but. No, and the, and the 47 was also kind of, that. that's a plane that also lost a lot of, of planes. Um, it was kind of a widow maker. It was sort of a medium. Um, that it's a beautiful airplane, and they would do these. They do toss bombing with it. So they've got they're loaded with a nuke, and basically, they would come in kind of low, and they'd pull up and release the weapon as they're basically doing a loop. They'd release the weapon to toss it as far as they can, and they just go through a loop. And then you know, hit the afterburners and try to get as far away as they could before the nuke went off. And fortunately, they didn't have to do that that often. No, but they did practice it a lot. And there's some interesting video on YouTube of them doing it. Um, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. By the way, great point to say. If you have not seen Failsafe, the original, both the original oh, yeah. and the yeah. remake, which was done as a, it, which was done as a live TV play. Uh, spearheaded by George Clooney, both of those. I, the original is just simply phenomenal. Which, um, with Henry Fonda as the U.S. president, and uh, and a young Larry Hagman as his interpreter, um, and, and Dom DeLuise is in it in a oh, in a totally non comedic role. And the book's really good too. Oh, the book was amazing. Yeah, yeah. That, and what was there was a key difference? I forget what it was about the book that was different from the movie. I, I don't remember. It's been so so long since I've read the I mean, book or the movie. It, it was especially growing myself growing up in the '60s and having been through air raid drills when I was in elementary school. Um, you know, growing up, the Failsafe was just one of those movies that you you had to watch because it it was so um, relevant to the times. And um, and if you're if you're uh, ignorant of Failsafe, Failsafe was basically. Um, um, it was. It basically posited that um, there was a computer malfunction, and uh, when uh, the U.S. was uh, having, uh, you know, war games, one of its bombers never got the recall notice and heads to Moscow with a full nuclear payload. And um, and what would happen? And what would we do? Including uh, the U.S. president ordering the B-52 shot down by U.S. aircraft. Um, and what happens when it actually gets through and destroys Moscow? Uh, and it is a just a sh – and um, I'm not going to give it away because you have got to watch this movie. But uh, I lived in New York, and it freaked the fuck out of me. Um, oh, yeah. It, it really did. Um, uh, you know, it, it, and so – it is one of those must-see movies, and we don't hear much about it anymore. However, it is mind-boggling. I mean, people talk about Doctor Strangelove a lot, um, which you know, which is is a great movie. But Failsafe is such something you really need to watch. And of course, in Failsafe, the key airplane they're using B fifty eights, B fifty eight Hustlers, um, yes. were the bombers that they were. They were using, um, which is which is kind of important. I can't remember if they called them B-58s in the movie. They didn't in the novel. No, it was a right. fictional airplane in the novel. It was a fictional airplane, right. Yeah, 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 right. Um, so. And they showed, they, they showed B-58s, but, but the – they showed B-58s, but they showed uh, – um, in the movie they had side-by-side -side cockpits, whereas the B-58 is not a side-by-side -side airplane. It's an, right. it's an, an echelon airplane. Um, and so um, there's a great video uh, on YouTube about the B-58 that this B-58 lands and it pulls up and they bring up the, the, the stairwell and the pilot gets out and he takes off his helmet and it's Jimmy Stewart. Yep. Not, not because Jimmy Stewart was playing a B-58 pilot. It's because he had just landed a B-58. Yeah, he was a general. He was an Air yeah. Force general. Yeah, he retired as an Air National or Air Air Force Reserve general. He had been a a, a wing commander 
in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, he had been a pilot before the war, and he joined and was able to like get assigned to a combat unit um, and was a B-24 Liberator pilot. Uh, a, a friend of mine, when a friend of mine was working at a law firm, uh, this, one of the senior lawyers in that firm had been a was a friend had been a friend of Jimmy Stewart. I think Jimmy Stewart had already died by then, um, because they had been um, they had been pilots in the war together, if I remember correctly, or maybe after the war. But but um, uh, Curtis LeMay said something like, "If the war had gone on another two months, we would have made him a we would have uh, made him a general." As it was, he he like retired as a. He left active duty as a colonel, but he continued to fly and he continued to do stuff. And he played, I can't remember. I think he did a movie called Strategic Air Command, and I think they were flying Hustlers. Yeah, I can't remember if they were flying Hustlers in that one or B-47s. They might have been flying 47s. Could be. I'm, I'm, I'm not. It's been very long since I've seen that movie. I know, he, I know he played a movie where he flew B, B-47s because I want to say I saw the YouTube video and he had a he had like a medical issue while he was flying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah that, his, son, his son was also killed in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. But, and, and after, after the war, Jimmy Stewart, uh, his contract with whatever studio he was with forbade them from mentioning his war service. They were not really? allowed to mention it in any of their marketing material. Um, and Strategic Air Command, which I haven't seen in 30 years, um, had both B-36s and B-47s in them. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Scott Voigt says they were flying B-47s, and prior to that, with the B-36 out of Carswell Air Force. Okay. AFG, AFB, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I remember when I, geez, I remember as getting back to the B-52 as a kid, uh, if you remember the monogram B-52 model was like the biggest model injection molded model kit you could buy because it was in, enormous. And mm. uh, uh, I remember my friend and I building one when we were a kid. The, those were big. But, yeah, you know, the thing I was going to mention before as we were talking about planes is the thing we don't see anymore is the incredible turnover uh, in the life or, or the very short lifespan of aircraft. I mean, you go through the Century series of fighters. You go from the F-100, boom, 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 boom. you know, the F-101 Voodoo, the 102 and 103. Then you get to the 104. I mean, they were just churning them out and going through them and, mm -hmm. and one after another. And, you know, the lifespans were relatively short. And I think really until you got to the F-4 Phantom. Yeah. And um, a large – there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that we were at the we were at the the part of the learning curve where you were learning an awful lot. Paradoxically, people talk about the steep part of the learning curve being the part you don't want to be on. It's actually the part you do want to be on because it's the part where a little bit of effort and you learn a lot. Um, just like people say quantum to mean really big when quantum really means really small. Um, but they were at the they were at the part of the learning curve where where like you know they were making they would make an airplane obsolete three years later um, with yeah. jet engines and with jet fighters and the other issue they ran into with that though is that um, is that those early jet airplanes had a lot of problems and they crashed a metric shit ton of them. You know, we saw the 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 stats That's the steep learning part. curve part. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not part, sure you want. <laughs> this Speaking part, to somebody who does that for a living, I'm okay not being on the steep end of that curve. Yeah, that, <laughs> that steep learning curve was going down into the ground. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't unusual to just crash a shit ton of airplanes. I mean, we crashed um, learning how to do aircraft carrier ops with jet fighters. We crashed lots of airplanes. And part of it was the jet engines of the day. You know, there were a lot of pilots early on that weren't real fans of jet engines. Yeah, they could get you a higher top speed, um, but they weren't very responsive. You had a lot better response to um, uh, – you had a lot better response with a, a propeller-driven airplane. And yeah, so they respond instantly. Yeah, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I was coming in for landing – 
my my brand new first off this was at a previous company a long time ago but my brand new off first officer a uh, little bit of gusty wind so our airspeed went up and so he pulled the power back and he idled it on short final going into LaGuardia and uh, I have never moved my hand faster <laughs> than when I pushed his throttle full back forward uh, for him because I didn't want those engines to spool down because otherwise we were too low to the ground we were we would hit kind of hard uh, and uh, we would have hit kind of hard if those engines had spooled down. Is, so, is that one of the ones where you went to the bar afterwards? No, no, no. This was okay. over and done with quick. <laughs> only, only a couple uh, trips to the bar uh, in my career so far. <laughs> uh, so Jim Westbrook says, I'm glad to hear someone else use the USAF measuring term metric shit ton. Um, I actually, I don't think I, picked it up from the Air Force. I just started saying it at one point. Um, and I will frequently intersperse it with a uh, metric shit ton, a thousand shit kilograms. Um, but so, um, I yeah, I'll say one of my, one of my, one of my great moments was I had a friend who was a Rio on a wild weasel. Um, uh, okay. and, and he, and one day we get into a. He one day he tells me that the uh, F eighty six Saber was America's uh, was the first operational jet fighter, not American. It was the first operational jet fighter. I was like, dude, I mean, two. What I said, you were in the Air Force and you don't know that. And he said, no, no, no. And we anyway, we made a bet. And uh, yeah, I think it was like we bet lunch or something. I was like, dude, that's not even an argument. I I said, I can't believe you're take. And of course, he lost. And it was. Totally embarrassed. And I was like, you in the Air Force? Don't what the fuck do they teach you in the Air Force? <laughs> <laughs> so Air Force propaganda. What's that? Air Force propaganda. Air Force, yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it was the F-86 wasn't even the first operational US jet. Now it was the first US jet to see combat. I, I, no. I get no? Uh, the PA no. PA 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 eighty saw combat in Korea at the in fact, I believe there was more P-80 combat in Korea than F-86 combat. It's just the F-86 wow, was I've never there. seen anything about that. Yeah. I don't. I, I think I saw that relatively recently. I've been watching lots of aviation videos on YouTube. There's some really good aviation videos out there. Like there's one on the – in order to try to solve that propeller versus jet problem, there's uh, the Air Force at one point created an airplane that got nicknamed the Thunder Screech. And the idea was is that they took a – a turboprop airplane and put on a propeller that was designed to go supersonic. Wow. Uh, so the, 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 the propeller tips were the propeller itself was going to be supersonic and it basically created this continuous sonic boom that was so violent that it made people sick. Like it made ground crew sick and, and you know, blew out windows, and and like one one test pilot said that on a day off, he was he was like twenty miles away from Nellis Air Force Base, and he could hear it when they started it up. Damn. Yeah, and it was the only turboprop ever built with an afterburner. That's but they, crazy. It was, and they never tested the afterburner. It only flew like five times for like less than five hours, and every one of the five flights had to declare an in-flight emergency and land. Uh, Timothy uh, Kizal yep. Adlo, yes. The National Museum of the United States Air Force, Of course, I assume we're talking about Wright-Patterson? Yes. Right, that's the, and the official name of it, which is where Chris Weave works. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm five minutes away from that museum. Yeah, and I have never been there, and I absolutely want to go. Um, uh, we we were talking right before the COVID. We were ta actually talking about doing, uh, you know, doing a series of uh, visits to the great air museums in in the country because there's some just absolutely fantastic. I mean, obviously, right. Wright Patterson uh, National Air and Space Museum, both locations in DC. Uh, the, the the museum down here in Macon. Oh. The Air Force Museum down here in Macon is spectacular. Um, yeah. it, it is truly amazing. And then, of course, uh, ones like uh, Pensacola has the great Navy, Naval Aviation Museum. That is fantastic. There's one in Seattle. Um, uh, the Boeing. Is that, oh, yeah. 
you know, Boeing Field over there. Right. Great museum there also. And there's Intrepid in New York City. Yep. Yep. The only place on earth where you can see an SR-71 sitting on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> exactly. But that didn't happen all the time? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Did they I, use those in the Doolittle raid? I don't remember. <laughs> Air Force propaganda. <laughs> so, so Alec, if you know, once I, once I have a house, uh, uh, you can come out and I'll, I'll be happy to put you up. That would be awesome. I, that, that would be awesome because I, I mean, I'm dying to see the museum. I have a matter of fact on my Facebook page. I have a a cover image that I often use. Um, that I'll pull up of, of the museum because I mean the big thing for me is the XB70, right? Yeah. The, the, sole, the sole surviving XB70 is there, and I think that is just. Uh, and then you've got also in the in the photo that I will pop up here. I'll have to uh, edit my cover photo to uh, uh, to show it. There, I know you have the lifting. You have a whole bunch of lifting bodies. The yeah. XB4A, the XB24B, uh, the um, one of the you know, one of those one of those lifting bodies I sat in as a kid. Really? And for the life of me, I have absolutely no reason why the, it was there at a shopping mall in Des Moines, Iowa. But it was like doing a coast. To, they were taking it coast to coast. This was long after it was decommissioned. And they, they stopped at this shopping mall. And you could just go up. And we just stumbled. Apart. It wasn't like announced or anything. And you could... I. I got a chance to sit in a, in an X24. Um, I think it was the X24. Um, I'd recognize it. It wasn't the M2F2. It wasn't the HL10. It was, a, it was the third one. And it, you know, there was an A model and a B model. And I think they, it must have been the B because they remanufactured the A into the B. So there, the, both of those didn't exist at the same time. And so, because I remember I got to sit in it. There was a guy there and I got to sit in it. And then they just left it in the parking lot overnight. Oh my God. Trailer. And later I talked my parents into, can we go back and take a look at this thing again? And so you couldn't sit in it the second time. Yeah. And so if you look at that picture, that XB70 is really tall. It's so tall that they can fit other airplanes underneath it. Yeah, and I'm just looking. So in that photo, um, it, which is it's just shocking. It's amazing. You got the XB70. You got the X24A and X24B underneath it. Yeah, you know what? I'm I'm wrong. They they must not. They must have had an X24A that they didn't convert. But I I know that they converted one of them. The the one. Um, okay, that. Yeah, that's the new museum, I think. So the problem with that, I, I shouldn't say it's not a problem with that. Yeah, right, but this is because originally the X20, the X70, the XB70 was outside, wasn't it? And then they moved it to the hangar. So I never saw it outside. I've been going to this museum off and on for a while because I lived in DC and I, I'm from Iowa. And so it was easy to just stop and, and kill an hour in the museum or whatever. So the first time I went to the museum, it was a three bay museum and now it's like a five or six bay museum. And so they basically, they put more and more airplanes in, they cram them tighter and tighter and tighter together. And then they build a new bay and it sort of decompresses out to fill it. And then at one point when they did that, they actually moved all the X planes to another hangar. And I never saw the X planes when they were in the other hangar, but I did see them when they were really tightly compressed. And just like it is there, like the XB-70 is tall enough that you can fit other airplanes underneath it. Because, I mean, when you're standing on the ground, look at um, directly below the, um, the, the forward um, uh, control surface of that XB-70. If you look down there, you can see people down there, right? Oh, yeah. Look oh, at yeah. How, that airplane is like three stories tall. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's, it's like 747 height. Which uh, Apollo yeah. capsule do they have there? I don't remember. But you got, got a, I mean, just in that photo, you've got an SR seventy one. Uh, you got a thunder in the background. Uh, geez, I mean, it's just it's crazy. So it uh, like D twenty one. I think that's a D twenty one drone directly in front. Oh, they got the Goblin in there, the X forty seven Goblin. Oh, if you look right yep, in front yep, of the yep. intake, 
that's my, oh, I love that, which was basically a parasite fighter that was designed for the B-36 to have one underneath it so that when it was penetrating Soviet airspace past its fighter cover, it could drop the air, the, the little fighter, which would, I don't know what the hell it would do against a full-size fighter, but anyway, it was supposed to, you know, protect the, the bomber and uh, and then re that. <laughs> it sounds like man chat. So, <laughs> so for somebody said the M two F two was crashed by Steve Austin. At least it, it may have been the M two F two in the book in the in the TV series. It was the HL ten. Um, it was the HL. Was it? No, it was the M two F two. In in Six Million Dollar Man. So when you see the airplane drop from the B fifty two, that's an HL ten. When when they show him outside the airplane getting ready to do the flight, it's an HL-10. If they and they talk about the HL-10, the crash video that they show is an M2F2. Right, right, um, right. Actually, I think the the part where it's going like this is the M2F2. I think the actual airplane rolling on the ground part is, if I remember correctly, I think that's an X-15. Now, oh, well, I could be wrong on that. I could be wrong on that. Let's see. Well, let, huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, why don't we Why don't we just pop up the uh, the opening? Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 let's see if I can find if I can find it on YouTube here. Uh, but oh yeah, here we go. Which of course, and Six Million Dollar Man was. Um, oh. Let's see. Let's see if they have it. Oh no, this is the. Oh yeah, here we are. Well, that was the op. Okay, so I'm going to try to get to the right part of. Of it, to show. Okay, so let me, let me do the right thing here. Let me close that one, and let me uh, share the screen. Make sure I share audio for a change. All right, let's see if I can do this right. So yeah, so uh, you're right there in that it's a uh, it's an HL10 on the on the B52. It's an HL10. Um, yeah. But once he starts losing it, yeah, it's a that, the M2F2 is the one that crashed. I'm pretty sure. It, it, yeah, and I must be thinking of something else. There's some other thing where they showed the a crash of an airplane, and it was an X15 that that they showed. It wasn't whatever they claimed, and I I thought it was this, but I could be wrong about. It. I must be wrong about it. Um, it says well, here hey, in, the, you know, so. in, in the 1987 TV film, The Return of the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman, just sort of rolls off the tongue. Uh, Austin refers to the craft as the M3F5, which was the name used for the aircraft that crashed in the original Cyborg novel. So, yes. Alec, are you there? Pat, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I'm generally, just, unless I was talking, I was generally muting it just in case uh, uh, mini me over there was making noise and stuff. Oh, it looks like Alec is. Uh, Alec is frozen. Frozen, or he's standing very still. <laughs> um, let's see here. All right. So. You know, uh, Chandler Archibald here rep, uh, um, <laughs> mentions the bridges of Toko Ri. Uh, yeah. 
as the 1950s Top Gun. So that was a great movie also. Really enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> At the very beginning, Chandler asked a question about the Star Trek First Frontier fan film. We need to remember to ask Alec that when he comes back. Oh, okay. Yeah. My guess is Lissa probably just kicked him if, if Alec didn't kick himself. Yeah. Um, and so he'll be coming back on. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, the one thing we haven't talked about yet is uh, Star Trek and Starship Combat since we're still in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes we haven't actually done that yet this sometimes this sometimes people do come and <laughs> come here for that so yeah and we probably should um i my my guess is i that neither one of us probably has screen sharing capability yet although sorry ah, there he is. hey Gee, welcome back hotel Gee, internet so welcome what's that I said to your show, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did want to also uh, share this screen. Because I, uh, the National Alex, Museum of the United States Air Force, there's just a um, great, if you go to their site, I mean, there's a picture of the museum from the air. It's pretty impressive, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see what else. There, there. So here's a World War II. I mean, it looks really beautiful. Oh, B twenty nine. Is that yep. an important B? Is that one? Of, is that boxcar? Boxcar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Nola Gay is in. Um, um, I actually, I think they have more than they may have one more in one B twenty nine. So that particular one may not be boxcar, but they do have boxcar there. Um, uh, Nola Gay is at Udvar Hazy. First time I saw Nola Gay, uh, she was at the Overflow Restoration Facility in Suitland, Maryland, and she was in parts. Wow! Because uh, apparently, so my um, uh, uh, my dad's best friend from high school had seen uh, seen I think it was Nola Gay here at Wright Patterson back in like the sixties and they just basically left it outside to rust. Wow. Um, and, and he was a Navy guy, but he was really into aviation and stuff. And he sees this thing and it's like, I can't believe they're doing this. Eventually the Smithsonian took it and the, you know, it was, they just had it in parts in their hangar for a while and then they restored it. Um, I don't have any idea what the story on boxcar is. I, I don't know about boxcar. So that's great. Wow. Well, um, have you been to the museum again since you moved back to uh, to the area? A couple of times. Um, I, I've been there for one or two events. Every now and then they'll do an event there. And my experience with the events has kind of been, I shouldn't say negative. The problem is, is that they're very, very popular. And so you end up in this situation where you have to wait like 45 minutes to get to a parking space. Uh, and then you've got like, you know, a hundred thousand people, it seems like in the museum and, you know, that just wasn't very fun. I, I, I'm much happier with a museum that's totally empty <laughs> than one that's totally full. Um, so, um, but I've been, a have been a couple of times, there's been some stuff over there. Um, it's, I haven't been as much as I would like to, um, in part because the books, the museum bookstore used to be fantastic. Used to be. Oh, really? It stopped What's being a bookstore and became a place to buy toys. Uh. Um, and so I think it's basically, you know, they lost out to Amazon and stuff, but it used to be a place where you could go and like, you know, I mean, it was like an aviation bookstore second to none. Um, or at least second to not very much. And yeah, it's just not that impressive anymore. Oh, well, that, that's a shame. That, uh, yeah. So, I, uh, the, so the, the museum and then the museum, um, in the Air Force Museum in Macon, Georgia, 
I, I want to say it's making. Yeah, let me just do. The, I mean, we're not talking. Uh, all a fascinating uh, conversation. Although I apologize to everyone because we're not really talking about Star Trek or star space combat right now. Museum of Aviation in uh, Macon, Georgia. And I was incredibly impressed by it when I first went there. Um, uh, they say they're the second biggest aviation museum in the country, and I said, I don't think so. Uh, I think you're number three. Uh, I, had a, I, I tried to be nice about it, um, but the guy at the information desk was, I, I went with uh, Dave Simpson, but I was really impressed by that. It was really, really amazing. Uh, they have U2 there, too, and, and uh, lots of small aircraft, but also some bigger aircraft, too, and an A-10 and everything. It, it was really nice. Um, Jim Westbrook says, Alec, I, for one, am not missing the Star Trek aspect. The discussion is fun. Yeah, listen, I think one of the things is we're all big geeks here. We're, you know, we're not just Star yeah. science fiction geeks, we're aviation geeks, so... Uh, we love talking about all of this stuff. But, yeah, maybe, you know, we, um, I, I think the great thing is Wright-Patterson is so centrally located in the country. Um, mm -hmm. that it's a great first trip for us all to do uh, is to is have a, a weekend event at the museum um, for all, all of Axnar fans um, and maybe even get them to uh, – they must have a theater there we could rent out. No? They do have a theater. I have no idea how much it costs to do stuff there. Um, well, I know that we've talked about doing stuff there for, for there's one particular event that I'm associated with um, that has no budget whatsoever. And we talked about doing something there and sort of failed our morale role when we heard what the price would be. So... I am. Let's see. I am um, trying Steve to make sure. Will, that I have to come back next week, because I, uh, in in the eight minutes we have left, I don't think we could even graze the subject of strategy and tactics used by Starfleet and the Klingons and XR. That is a subject for another day, but uh, we will we will definitely talk it. So today, and and I should say that um, I was uh, talking today to Crystal about it, and um, uh, I am working um, with some writer on um, publishing the script for Axnar as a novel, getting a full-length novelization of the full script of Axnar. Um, so that is uh, that is in the works. And, um, that would be uh, cool. Yeah, I find myself with a little, having sold my house, I find myself with a little extra cash and thinking, well, <laughs> besides putting it back into another house, I could like skim a little off and uh, – and get the uh, yeah, Patrick Doyle is like yes, do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, because I think that be that that would be a lot of fun. Um, so uh, Scott Little says was out at on the base at Warner Robins uh, a year or so ago filming a National Guard commercial. Got to see the backyard of the museum there at Warner Robins Air Force Base. Oh yes, very cool. Yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty pretty impressive. Um, Super Crew 63 says, my knowledge of aircraft exceeds my Star Trek knowledge. Hey, it's all good. Knowledge in all its forms is good. So, uh, we, we can we, so we could actually discuss a, a question that Chandler had, Chandler Archibald had early on. Sure. Which, is, which I was looking for the exact wording of it, but it's for some, the chat feature in YouTube drives me to distraction at times. It sort of scrolled off the top, I guess. Um, but it basically was boil, boiled down to a discussion about um, uh, Star Trek First Frontier. And, uh, you know, they, they filmed on the Axonar set, is my understanding, et cetera, et cetera. If you, if you can talk about that a little bit, is that true? Did we? Um, no, well, First Frontier filmed five years ago before we were even in Georgia. So, um, uh, there was, no, First Frontier and Scott Little is a. Uh, He's in the, uh, is, in the chat. Scott, yeah, Scott, as a matter of fact, uh, Alyssa is probably not, uh, not paying attention at the moment. Oh, there she is. Hey, Alyssa, are you friends with Scott Little or else I will? I'll just send him an invite. We Maybe we can get Scott himself on and Scott can talk to you. Yeah. Uh, First Frontier. You know, if you haven't seen it, First Frontier, uh, Star Trek First Frontier, which is the, the tale of the first 
uh, Flight of the Enterprise with uh, Robert April. Um, let me, there's Scott Little. Scott, I'm gonna, I don't know if you're free right now, but if you are here, I am gonna send you a, um, an invite. Maybe you can join us and we can uh, have a little brief little chat about Star Trek First Frontier. Um, uh, the, the, the sad part, is, um, Scott says, First Frontier filmed in a small strip mall off Georgia 120 in Marietta. There you go. Um, the, the sets, uh, oh, Scott doesn't have a webcam. Uh, well, hey, you can still come on and just use audio. How do you not have a webcam, Scott? Seriously, you don't have a webcam, and your computer does. You don't. You're not on a Mac, so you don't have a built. -in. I am sending you a webcam, Scott. <laughs> I'm going to send you one because that is totally unacceptable. Uh, your Scott is part of the Axonar team as well. He's one of our construction foremen, or whatever you want to call him. Uh, he's amazing. He's a super nice guy, and uh, we love him to death. And um, <laughs> so the. So last year we went and um, empty two storage units over in Marietta uh, of the of the First Frontier sets, and Kenny Smith, who who basically um, who, who was the producer of First Frontier, said, "Hey, Eddie, keep quiet." Said, uh, "Oh yeah, you need, these sets are great." Blah 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 blah. And so we got them and we emptied we emptied the two units, and I was a little sketchy on them. I was like, "Okay." And we saved them and brought back the transporter, the bridge and the transporter and part of sick bay uh, and part of a conference room. And uh, when we got them, we're like, these sets aren't really great. They look great on film. And Scott Little's like, yeah, we made them to last the weekend, not five years. And that is <laughs> like typical, ho that is so typically Hollywood. Yeah. That is like, you know, unless you're doing a TV show, you're like, how can I get away the cheapest possible? You know, so um, at this point, there are no First Frontier set pieces at all. Uh, sure. We have the columns for the conference room. And, uh, and, and the control and panel. Everything. Um, the, Itty. Sorry. So my dog's I, think, I think you said something also about keeping a control panel. We kept the uh, Helm Nav console and we kept yeah. the conference room table. And both of those went to Glenn Wolf at, at Warp 66 Studios in Arkansas. Um, oh, okay. he, he really wanted them. And I was like, look, I don't know when we're going to use these. And Glenn is always doing stuff. So we traded uh, traded them off on those. Um, and, you know, that which is good. It's good to support other fan films. Um, uh, yeah, and Scott, don't you have a smartphone? Because you, all you need is a smartphone to sign on to us. But uh, um, anyway, there you go. So, um, so all right, Scott, we'll get you on another time, and you can talk about First Frontier. But um, uh, First Frontier is great guerrilla filmmaking. Yeah, there, there was, there was something. What was I was going to say? We, about we kept the transporter room, uh, and we trashed it because Dana Wagner said he said to me, Alec, if we build a transporter room, I, he said we will redo it. Because I he he wanted something that was going to build to his standards and to last. Remember, this Dana Wagner built his own house. Everything's bulletproof for him. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. So uh, that that's it. Um, but go ahead. Oh, I was going to say. Um, what was I going to say? It was something. Oh, so I somehow the YouTube algorithm decided that I wanted to know about the Waltons for reasons I don't I don't <laughs> understand. And it turns out that that Judy Norton Taylor, who played the eldest daughter in the Waltons, is doing a bunch of YouTube videos about the making of the Waltons. And she does a video about the house. And the house is on a back lot on the studio. And she's going through and explaining like what the house was really like. Like for instance, it, there you can't the stairways that go upstairs they go around the corner and then there's like a little platform for people to hang out on when they're waiting for their cue to come down the stairs mm -hmm. and like if you go in through the back door of the house the back porch and you turn left you're in the makeup room for when they're doing a remote shoot on the back lot and you know it was it was it was interesting 
it's one of the one of the interesting things about filmmaking is the difference between the reality and what you're seeing on the screen and how tightly you have to control stuff. So like they had if you're seeing somebody like sticking their head out a window or something like that, or you can look into the house that was filmed on a sound stage. But if they're standing outside the house in the yard, that was filmed on the back lot. Hmm. And, but they'll like seamlessly cut between the two. I just find all that stuff fascinating. So. Yeah, I'm, oh, Alec is, hey, you're, Mike's I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, when you, when you find out about the, there's so many interesting things, interesting Hollywood behind the scenes stories. When you find out about that stuff, sometimes it's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it is, it, it, you ultimately things like Star Trek are much, the, the things that are fascinating are not the big standing sets, but how they do things, how they change our sets. I mean, geez, with Star Trek, especially constant changing of planetary sets, and other, you know, how do they do other bridges and of other ships and all? It, it, it's really interesting. The styrofoam has to be an entirely different Any color part? for the next episode. So there's, sorry, um, that? I said the styrofoam has to be an entirely different color for the next episode. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so well, you I use your body. Body. Looking at Go Scott ahead. Little. Scott Little says they had a budget of maybe 15 grand for all the Star First Frontier sets. Um, well, you guys stretch that budget out pretty well. I mean, because it looks good on film, which is what is ultimately important. Yeah. I heard a great little statistic, uh, a great little factoid about the making of Star Wars. The, um, the boots for the Imperial uniforms were apparently really uncomfortable. And so all those scenes where Peter Cushing is like ordering the destruction of Alderaan and when he's intimidating Princess Leia, etc., he was wearing slippers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah we, we need to see that behind the scenes footage, right? He's like yeah. in fuzzy slippers or something. That that would be funny. That would be funny. Well, uh, we are at the end of our hour and and uh, of today's uh uh, American Aviation uh, Edition uh, of <laughs> Tactical. By the way, I was going to ask Pat before. Pat, what what different planes have you actually flown? How many how many different uh, planes? Have you flown? I think I've flown about fifteen to twenty different airplanes. A lot of light single engine airplanes: Cessna one fifty two, seventy two, one eighty two, one seventy two RG. So a lot of variations of similar planes. So that's as an instructor. Um, flew a Duchess and a Baron and a Travel Air. Those are light twin engine airplanes. Um, flown a T-34, uh, which is a little turboprop plane uh, trainer Ooh, that the Navy trainer, yeah, the is that the Is the uh, T-34 the Texan? No, T-34, it's the, it was the T-34 Mentor. The oh, okay. T-34C, the C version with the uh, uh, turboprop. Uh, let's see here. What else? Uh, Cherokee one six, uh, the Piper Archer, Piper Cherokee, uh, Piper Warrior. Um, and then a, um, Embraer Brasilia, uh, Canada regional jet, the CRJ 200. I've flown the 700, actually 700 and the 900. As a matter of fact, this past week I flew a 700 and a 900. Um, actually, I flew a plane for Endeavor this week that I had probably flown 15 years ago back in uh, when I was at a different airline uh, called Comair. Uh, I mean, the, the exact same airframe? Yeah, the exact same airframe. It had the Comair, Comair numbers on it and everything like that. So, um, and uh, one hour in an, a little light light single engine airplane called the Tomahawk, the Piper Tomahawk. They used to call it the Trauma Hawk. A lot of people, uh, you know, it had some weird characteristics to it apparently. And I do have about five seconds at the stick of an A4 Skyhawk. <clears throat> um, nice. So, 
uh, I got when I was a midshipman, got to go down and go fly. I got two rides in an in an A4, one in a little air combat thing. In you know, having been a college student and not a you know hardened pilot at the time, I spent most of that flight puking upside down at five Gs. <laughs> <laughs> And I will say, you know, mission accomplished. <laughs> I remember when the Blue Angels flew the A fours. Yep. And um, they went from the A fours to the F eighteen. The F eighteens. Yep. And I saw a show uh, with the F with the A fours, and then I saw a show with the F eighteens, mm -hmm. and it was like it was night and day. Because the, I mean, listen, precision flying is precision flying. It's awesome. But I also saw, I think it was the Thunderbirds when they were flying F4s. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like a flight of F4s flying low over the airfield. To <laughs> rally your jet. I mean, that was just epic. Yeah. And, then the A, yeah. and, then, and then you have an experience with the A4 and you're like, oh, that was cute. You know? <laughs> that about I I saw the uh, the first time I saw the Blue Angels. They were flying F fours. Uh, they came to Des Moines and they did a show at the at the Des Moines Airport. I think it was at the Des Moines Airport. Maybe we'd gone to Omaha or something for that. Um, and like two weeks later, they had a collision. Ooh! And lost two air crew. I mean, like two two complete crews. So they. And they, they flew with back seaters, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, it was it was bad. It was bad. Oh yeah, um, Chandler Archibald. He was on that trip with me, so he's on the he's on the chat right now. So uh, oh, Chandler. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 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 yeah. If you're not used, if you're not used to pulling that, you know, doing that, I'm I'm no fighter pilot. If if you're not used to doing that, you're gonna get uh, <laughs> get sick or unconscious. So. Oh God. So Pat, as somebody who may fly on your airline someday, I hope you never get used to that. <laughs> <laughs> Philip Banks, I guess, is in New Zealand. He says, "Hey, I think A4 Skyhawks were the last combat fighter jets we had in New Zealand." Yeah, I don't really think about combat jets in New Zealand much. It's not like uh, not like there's a lot of uh, yeah a, a lot a, of military threats down there. Uh, down on yeah, Skyhawk's a, a small attack aircraft. It's not a fighter aircraft. It's not an air-to-air -air, uh, fighter. Aircraft. They used it in Top Gun as an adversary, uh, but you you know I I I'm not even sure. I'd have to go back and research. Uh, whether it could even carry air-to-air -air missiles, it could probably carry two, maybe I think. But um, but no, it was not a dogfighter. It was it was a yeah. light light attack aircraft. It probably yeah, it probably could carry air-to-air -air because that was usually the that was what made something a light attack. Often was at least was what made something a light attack aircraft versus a heavy. That's why the A sevens were listed as light as well, to carry air, -to air, and they could be a poor man's. A poor man's air defense interceptor, if they needed to be. Yep, uh, an A four could carry sidewinders. Yeah, that doesn't doesn't surprise me. Doesn't yeah. surprise me. Um, <laughs> Just happen to have some reference material sitting nearby. <laughs> what game is that from? Air superiority. Uh, old, okay. game I used to, old air air hex based air to air combat game I used to play back in high school. GDW uh, yep. J D Webster, if I remember. J D right. Webster. Yep, I got to meet him at uh, Origins uh, a couple times. Uh, so real nice guy. Uh, he was a Northwest Airlines pilot, which means he would now be a Delta pilot. Okay. If he's still flying. I did not know that he was, I mean, I guess I assumed that he must have been a pilot, but to be honest, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, no, he was an A-7 pilot in the Navy. I don't know if what, what other aircraft he flew, but yep. So, but yeah, real nice guy. Got to meet him and, uh, and have a beer with him a long time ago. So, which was really neat because, you know, I used to spend hours playing that game. Many, many hours. I think I which still have a copy. Which game What's was that, Pat? Uh, it's a game called Air Superiority. Um, it was a air-to-air dogfighting game, three-dimensional three movement, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
and uh, used to play that back in high school. It was made by a guy named J.D. Webster, who was a Navy pilot, uh, then a Northwest Airlines pilot. And I got to meet him at Origins, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, let's just, uh, before we sign off, let's talk about what we're going to talk about next week. Okay. Wow. So I, for, for what it's worth, I spent some time last week. I went through the triangle graphs that Winchell Chung had done and Winch, uh, Winch heard it. Somebody told Winch, Hey, Chris and Pat did this on the show. And so Winch and I spent the week talking back and forth on that. It's always good to talk to Winch. He's a great guy. Um, and so uh, Winch reminded me that he had, I, you may recall, I said, I wish there was a chart that did X that sort of mapped real ships to it. And there is. It was just farther down the page. I just hadn't scrolled down far enough to get to it. So I sort of revamped my slides a little bit from that. And I added some a few other things here and there, including... Um, uh, a little bit about, I had previously mentioned uh, many, many, many shows ago about the 1975 U.S. Navy uh, reorganization where they changed all their ship classifications. Uh, this is relevant to Star Trek fans because Franz Joseph basically was using the old designation, as was FASA. And so if you want to understand why FASA has a frigate that's bigger than a destroyer, the reason why is probably has to do with what the U.S. Navy was doing at the time. Um, and then I also talked a little bit, I've got a couple of slides on like, what's the difference between a destroyer and a destroyer escort? And, and I'll, I'll show you visually how you can tell just by looking at a picture of a World War II small ship and you can tell if it's a destroyer or a destroyer escort. So... So I I got a bunch of slides and we didn't look at any of them, <laughs> but that's fine. So, well, um, and we still yeah, need well, the warp the warp factor chart. So, okay, uh, all right. So so uh, next weekend, uh, uh, what what should we title the show? I'll get a special header made. So we can promote it, and then force us to stick to our guns and not go off topic. Agreed. Okay. Um, designing warships. Let's call it designing warships. Designing warships. Okay, that's next weekend's show. All right. Everyone, designing warships, uh, and uh, or do, designing warships or designing warships for space combat. Um. Probably well, yeah, because this is mostly going to be about terrestrial stuff, I think. Oh, oh, oh gotcha. you know what? Okay. For those who didn't get their moment of buddy, he's here pestering me. <laughs> and he's been on my lap the entire time. He's been insistent. And Pat hates animals, so Pat doesn't have any, any animals to boast. <laughs> Pat, no dog, no cat. What? Two cats. River and uh, Simon. Oh, which which is new for I'm Pat. sorry, what's that? I have two cats, Simon and River. They're which, brother and sister. Si oh, all right. Way. You got two cats. All right. My book. Yeah. And cats are new for so, uh, yeah. Call it a night. We're going we're gonna to call it a night. It's my... my uh, uh, th yes, thank you to Super Crew 63. We appreciate it. Your, your super chat. We will see everyone next week, uh, Saturday night, 10 o'clock for Starfleet Tactical. As always, live long and prosper, everyone. Uh, have a good week. Tomorrow night is Two Geek Girls, and I will see you Monday for Extra After Dark. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks to Lissa, our producer, uh, Pat, and thank Chris. We will see you guys next week. Good night, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.